Imagine a world without pollinators. A world where we have to use paintbrushes to transfer pollen between plants. This is starting to happen in places throughout the world already. Now, without pollinators, the human race and all of Earth's ecosystems wouldn't survive. Around the world, pollinators are declining. Loss of habitat is the main reason, followed by improper use of pesticides, pollution, and invasive species. Pollinators and plants have a really special relationship, and neither can exist in isolation. Now, when you think of pollinators, raise your hand. Whose first thought was a honeybee? That's what I thought. <laughs> Now, you've probably already heard that bees have been struggling around the world due to a combination of risks, including parasites, pathogens, pesticides, climate change, industrial agriculture, monocultures, and loss of habitat due to urbanization. Now, the domestication of this species has now reached the point where these little bees depend on humans just for their survival. Now, the honeybees get a lot of the credit, but they're actually not the only ones that are doing all the hard work. We have way more creatures than just the honeybee that pollinate the plants here in New Zealand. But because they don't produce honey, a lot of them often get ignored. We have over 28 species of native New Zealand bees, and unlike the honeybee, most of them are solitary and they'll nest in the ground. We also have an array of birds, bats, lizards, skinks, butterflies, moths, flies, beetles, and other insects that all pollinate the plants that we need to survive. But many of these species are struggling. According to the latest Ministry of the Environment report, almost two-thirds of our rare ecosystems are threatened, and thousands of individual species are now at risk of extinction. That's 74% of our birds, 84% of our reptiles, and 80% of our bats, with insect numbers still mostly unknown. Now, we need to be doing everything that we can to turn these numbers around before it's too late, because this isn't the future that we want to be growing up in. Now, over half of the world's population are thought to be living in an urban area, but this figure is set to rise by over two-thirds by 2050. Now, the expansion and intensification of these urban areas is resulting in the loss of our soft landscape areas which in turn is resulting in the loss of crucial pollinator habitat. So growing food is known for shaping our countryside, right? We have these large-scale industrial farms that often specialize in producing one or two crops and selling them directly to the supermarkets. This idyllic countryside landscape is often where we imagine all of our pollinators to just run away and hide. We don't need bugs in the city, right? Well, actually, it's these places that they're struggling. Research has shown that in these high-intensity agricultural areas, our native bee populations declined by 90%, and some species just disappeared entirely. But the good news is, is these species are actually flourishing in the lower-intensity sites, like our community garden, which means that by welcoming them into our cities, we might actually have a chance of saving them. So growing food is gaining a lot more prominence within cities. And it's simple, we need to be growing our food where the people are. So locally grown food is helping to reduce the impact of climate change by reducing food miles and CO2 emissions. Now every little bit is important, from our larger community gardens to just growing a few things on your balcony. But without pollinators there to pollinate these things, these places are going to struggle because we know that the health and resilience of our native and our agricultural systems depends on biodiversity. So we need to have a wide range of pollinators to sustainably feed our growing nation. So my goal is to connect up key habitat patches, such as parks and urban agriculture hubs, using vegetated corridors to provide a place for pollinators to live, breed, travel and forage. 
Pollinators don't really care about property boundaries like we have to. So we form pollinator paths by connecting together both public and private land. So that includes our open spaces, our parks, our reserves, streams, town squares, nature play areas, playgrounds, and our sports field edges. This can then connect up with a series of green roofs and living walls. This would then link together with our community gardens, our city farms, and our urban agricultural hubs. It would then be strengthened by the planting that people do in their own back gardens. And then it would be linked by what we do with our transport corridors. So on our grass berms and verges, in our streetscapes, in our public transport network, along our walking and cycling paths, and along our highways to create a network of paths that runs throughout our city. So the major obstacles in urban areas for our pollinators are our transport corridors, our parking lots, and our buildings. So we need to be looking at really space-efficient ways of linking this habitat within our densest urban areas. So our cities are like a big jigsaw puzzle of green spaces. Every park and every pathway is an important piece of that puzzle. So why a pathway? Why does it even need to be connected? You see, all pollinators can travel at different distances. So we need to be designing to the lowest common denominator. And that's this guy. Our skinks and our lizards and our non-flying insects. You see, the birds and bees can fly for miles to find food, but these lizards can only run really short distances between patches of vegetation to avoid the predators. So we're starting to look into the plausibility of special crossings beneath our roads for our reptile friends. Now this is me when I was a kid. I was known as the bug girl. I absolutely loved bugs so much. And I was always that kid that was in class while all the other children and teachers were screaming about the big scary spider in the corner. I was the one going to save the day. And I always wanted to save the world, but I kind of wanted it to be a bit bigger than that. But I was also diagnosed with a pretty debilitating medical, medical condition, which I fought throughout my teenage years. There were many times that I actually thought I wasn't going to make it. But battling, it really gave me this sense of urgency, that if I was going to play a part in helping to save the world, then... I really had to get on with it. So after completing my degree in landscape architecture, at age 22, I set about my mission to create New Zealand's first pollinator path. So this path, it runs one and a half kilometers through Graylin, which is a suburb on the edge of Auckland's city center. It connects up a sports park and a large reserve with a local urban agriculture hub. So this is the first prototype path along the path. So this installation was put in in 2016, and we had a whole range of different stakeholders from local community groups to neighbors to local businesses. And we planted a whole array of different plants that all flower at different times throughout the year. We also installed bumblebee and leaf cutter bee boxes. We built a cascading masonry wall that we filled with different habitat materials. And we made sure that there was lots of ground covers, leaf litter, sticks and logs for the pollinators to be able to hide in. This is a photo from our opening day. We had over 100 people come to this really little park. And this was really humbling because it's easy to forget what's important as we go about our busy, often insulated lives. But this really reminded me that people do care and they do want change. And if we all work together, we can actually achieve some pretty cool things. So this one is the second park that we've installed along the pathway. So we worked with the Kalmana Gardens and the local community to create a communal welcoming area for both people and pollinators alike. Now the following installations are going to be completed on one massive event day next year, with a collection of businesses, schools and community groups sponsoring, creating and maintaining each section of this pathway. And this will include a pollinator art installation 
which will be done by the local school, where they'll grow and create a living artwork made of wildflowers. This installation will also have exposed sections of clay for the native bees. We will also have a hub for our butterfly pollinators, which will contain an array of different host plants that they need. We will be installing a range of different habitat boxes for birds and bats and bees. And we'll be installing some pollinator walls and educational murals that include a range of different habitat materials and plants in a modular space-saving arrangement. We will then be planting out all of the grass verges and the park edges along the pathway. Now currently there's a real lack of data, so we have had to use the philosophy of build it and the pollinators will come. But the next stage, I really want to get some research grants and sponsorships so that we can get ecologists testing and monitoring these sites to see how many more pollinators are using them. And then we want to connect and continue this network throughout the city. Now we have so many collaborations planned with a range of local businesses and community groups and I've been contacted by passionate people throughout New Zealand's major cities and even internationally to set up these networks. And as word spreads across the country, other cities will be able to adopt the framework and the guidelines that we've been creating. Well, I really hope that this inspires you to connect with your community and to go outside into your garden, onto your berm, maybe to your local school or to your park and just start to reimagine how you might be able to reshape this space just a little bit to make it just that bit more welcoming to our pollinator pals. It could really be as simple as planting some more flowers that flower at different times of the year and using natives as much as possible. It's always good to leave your garden just a little bit messy. You know, keep those fallen leaves and dead branches so that the pollinators have somewhere to hide. You could put out a tray of water with stones in it. That way insects have a place to drink that they won't drown in. And you can stop using pesticides in your garden and tell your local council that you want to have a spray-free neighbourhood. You could leave a patch of exposed soil for the ground nesting bees. Or you could even make your own pollinator wall or insect hotel with the kids. Let's start producing our food more locally and increasing this in connected habitat for the pollinators to help create the future that we want to see in the world. Because pollination really is the pathway to making healthier, more productive cities. Thank you.